Today, I will be concluding my look at resource excavation by satisfying the contract, extract ore from the moon and deliver it to Kerbin. In the first episode of this two-part series, I built, launched and inserted this vessel capable of bringing 2,550 units of ore from lunar orbit to Kerbin's surface. I also looked at how to use the various resource scanners that the game provides. This episode will focus on the building and operating of a lander capable of extracting ore from the moon's surface and bringing it up into orbit, thus allowing us to complete the contract. This will involve taking a close look at using the game's drilling excavators, in particular how to ensure you provide the correct amount of cooling so they'll run at peak efficiency. Finally, I will be finishing off the episode by looking at how to use the convertitrons that can convert your harvested ore into useful resources. Let's get started. We'll start with just a quick reminder of what the contract is. We need to acquire 2450 units of fresh ore from the moon and to land that ore onto Kerbin. And just a quick reminder that it was last episode that I built that ore hauler. If you're interested in that build and its deployment, go check this video out. But right now, I'm just going to give you a quick glance at the tech tree so you can see where it is that I am at in my career and get straight into the lander build. And this one is going to be built around the Mark 1 lander can. This is a single crude lander can which means it's really designed to operate in a vacuum not necessarily to re-enter in the atmosphere though if you're creative you can certainly get that done that makes it lighter than the command pods that you see in this game and uh, yeah we're just going to land a single kerbal down on the surface and I'll get into why a little later it is advantageous to have a kerbal along and that kerbal is not going to be a pilot so I'm going to add on an Octo 2 Pro core so that I will have flight control without having a pilot and then on top of that I'm going to put a clampatron docking port so let's add on our ore container so if I go to tanks here I have the small holding tank that holds 300 units of ore under that I'm going to put for some additional attitude control a set of advanced reaction wheels and then going back to the ore containers I'm going to put on eight of these radial holding containers each of which holds 75 units of ore now if you add that all up that only comes out to 900 units of ore and the contract clearly states we need 2450 units of ore to come back to Kerbin so what that means is is this thing's going to have to make three trips this thing's gonna have to go down to the surface fill up those ore containers and bring it up to our hauler which means you need to have the ability to refuel this thing so that it can do multiple landings now i happen to have a space station in orbit about the moon with a large quantity of liquid fuel and oxidizer in reserve so for this mission to work with this vessel, you are going to need to have a fuel supply in orbit about the moon capable of filling this thing up three times. It's that or just launch three of these vessels. In the meantime, we're just going to continue on with our build. On the bottom of this, we're going to put a Rockamax X200-8 fuel can. And then I'm going to grab eight R-4 dumpling external fuel tanks. And then on the bottom is going to go a single RE-1110 Poodle liquid fuel engine. Now one of the issues with a large engine like this is if I grab me some landing struts, these guys right here are the biggest ones that I have, and we'll probably just put on four of them, but it is hard to get these to extend below the engine bells in a natural way. So what I want to do is I want to build an extension downwards to get those uh, landing struts down. I also need, as you'll see in a little bit, a little bit more fuel on this thing. So I'm going to do both things at the same time using an Oscar B fuel tank. And we're going to start with putting on four of these in a radial way, like so. And then underneath that, I'm going to put another one and then another one on top so that I have a total of three. And that allows me to take my landing struts 
and attach them to the Oscar B. So it's accomplishing two things at the same time. It's extending those landing struts down below the engine bell and providing me with a little bit more fuel. And I'm going to also tuck them in so they look a little bit nicer. And it turns out that, well, I still need a little bit more fuel in this. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to repeat that process with the Oscar B. So this means I actually have, and but this time on two-way symmetry off to the side, we're going to be attaching something to this very, very shortly. Again, three of them. So this gives me a total of 18. And we'll tuck them in so they look a little nicer. Get them about the same level as the other ones. And if we end up going down here, putting this on vacuum and taking a look at our delta V, there are 3,256 meters per second of delta V in this vehicle, which if you've done a few moon landings, feels like a lot. But don't forget, this thing is going to ascend with all of these ore containers full. So that means there's going to be a lot more mass on the ascent. So this 3,256 meters per second is a little bit deceptive. We ran into the same problem last episode with our ore hauler. And we solved this by figuring out how much delta V we need to use in order to do the landing with the ore tanks empty, subtracting that off and then filling up the ore cans and seeing how much Delta V we had left to make sure that we were within our budget. Now for that, I do need a budget. If you check the common Delta V maps, it says that it should take you 580 meters per second to get from low moon orbit down to the moon surface and then another 580 to get back up again. But even in my own games, I find this number is pretty tight and I usually end up increasing it. And this being a tutorial, what I've been doing is increasing it even further than that. So for the landing, I'm going to add another 50% to the 580 to get it up to 870 for the landing and 25% to the 580 to get to 725 for the ascent. However, that is from a low equatorial orbit about the moon. My station happens to be in a 50 kilometer polar orbit. And there is some additional expense associated from being in a high orbit and also being in a polar orbit. So to both of these numbers, I'm going to add on another 100 meters per second to bring the landing to 970 meters per second and the ascent to 825 meters per second. So let's factor that in to our build here. So yeah, right now we have 3,256 meters per second of delta V, but what I'm gonna do now is reduce the amount of liquid fuel and oxidizer until I get down to the delta V that would be for our landing. Again, the landing is 970. So 3,256 minus the 970 means that I'll have 2,286 meters per second left when I am down on the moon's surface. So let's start reducing fuel until I see that on the Delta V guide here. And if anything, go a little bit past it. Here, let's get into the these guys. There we go, that should be good. So now this thing is, now we can imagine this thing is sitting on the surface with the amount of fuel we took for the landing out. And now just we'll fill up all those ore containers. And we can see that we would have 1,028 meters per second. That is our true delta V for making our ascent. I budgeted 825 for the ascent, so this is well over the ascent. We have plenty of fuel to get the job done with this lander. So I'll just take the ore back out and put back in the liquid fuel and oxidizer and continue with the build, which included a Communitron 16 antenna, four Illuminator Mark I landing lights, and a Kellis LV Mobility Enhancer, better known as a ladder. You may be recognizing that these additional parts will bring down the Delta V some more, but if you check at the end, you will find that the lander is still comfortably within our Delta V budget. The lander will need to dock, so I also added a pair of Stratus 5 roundified tanks and a total of 8 RV-105 RCS thruster blocks with, as always, the yaw, pitch and roll disabled to save monopropellant. Some people may be pointing out that actually this one thruster is going to be blocked or occluded by this landing strut, but it actually doesn't matter because this thruster is for thrusting in a forward direction. So yeah, these guys won't be helping us when it comes to moving forward, but these guys are unobstructed and since there's no break in the symmetry, we'll be able to thrust in a forward direction just fine. 
All right. Well, the, remember that this thing's central function is going to be drilling, and there's a key part I've not put on here yet, the drills themselves. So let's go down here to utility and take a look at the various drills. So there are actually two drills that we have. We have the Drillomatic Mining Excavator and the Drillomatic Junior. And we'll put both of them on here to give you an idea of their size. You can see that the uh, Drillomatic is rather large and the junior is significantly smaller and there's a huge mass difference as well the big one is one and a quarter tons while the small one is only one quarter of a ton so a one ton difference between the two for this lander I think it's pretty obvious we're gonna be using the smaller one so we'll throw these away and we're gonna put the smaller ones onto these Oscar B's that I already have prepared for it. Now, let's take a look at some of the requirements for this drill, starting with the electricity. If I go down here and take a look at the electricity, notice that there is a difference here between asteroid drill, comet drill, and then resource harvesting, which is for any other body including the moon and so you want to take a look make sure you are looking at the section that reflects the situation that you're going to be in so the electric charge that's required here is 0.9 electric charge per second and that's by the way per drill if I go into my electricity and I can get into these OX type solar panels here you'll see that they each provide 1.6 units of electric charge per second so these can cover it and uh, there's couple of options but I'm gonna go with the OX-4W 3x2 photovoltaic panels and we're just gonna put a pair of them up here towards the top now don't forget that these drills are going to be using up electricity whether you are in the Sun or not now for the moon the moonar night is 18 hours long and at 0.9 units well there's two of them so actually 1.8 units of electric charge per second for 18 hours I'll let you do the math. It's more batteries than we're gonna want to put on this thing. So in short, run this thing in the daylight. We're not gonna be running it through the night. Turns out though, that actually we can comfortably drill the ore that we need within the moon or day. So there's no reason for us to be spending much time in the night anyway. That said, I do want to put some additional battery storage on here and just arbitrarily I ended up putting on four Z400 rechargeable battery banks. This is probably overkill, but it's better to be more than it is to be less. So that's pretty much got our electricity needs covered, but there is another requirement that these drills require and that has to do with heating. If we scroll down here and take a look at the core heat, there is a fair amount of information here, but actually the one that's really important is the required cooling of 50 kilowatts. That's per drill. So each drill requires this amount of cooling. This is accomplished with radiators, something we've not had to consider up until this point. You will find the radiators under the thermal tab, and right now I have unlocked four different radiators and again what I'm looking for is something with at least 50 kilowatts of cooling and if I take a look at the thermal control system small and look at the core heating transfer that's the number you want all the rest of this really is a distraction this is the key number core heating transfer of 50 kilowatts it also requires some electric charge of 1.5 units per minute um, that's trivial compared to what we've already added on, so I, I'm, I'm already safely covering that, but it's the 50 kilowatts that I'm interested in. If I go right above it, there is also a radiator small that also has 50 kilowatts of cooling potential. Uh, so you might be wondering what's the difference between the two. Let's put them both on here. There's one of those, and there's the other one, and this one is extendable, and this one is not. So it is a personal you know, situation of your build, which one of these you want to use. Both of them out of the same amount of cooling. Now there is another difference between the two. There's a difference in mass. The, the non-extendable one is only 10 kilograms, while the extendable one is 50 kilograms, five times as much. There is though a bit of a profisal. They're not completely identical in their functionality. With the non-extendable one, it has this little note here, cools only nearby parts. You have to put 
the radiator very close to where the drill is and it measures that not by distance in meters it measures that by part separation how many parts do you have between this radiator and your drill and for instance if I take this away and just take a look at this this radiator is attached to this tank which is attached to the big tank which is attached to this set of reaction wheels which is attached to this tank which is attached to this oscopy which finally attaches to the drill that's way too many parts in between how many parts is actually the different it's actually I'm not entirely sure if I were using these types of panels I would make sure to put them on the same part that the drill is on that's the only way to be completely sure however I think what I'm going to do instead, mostly for aesthetic reasons, and because the extra 40 kilograms, well actually 80 kilograms of mass isn't that big a deal, I'm going to go with these extended ones and put on two of them like that. So that takes care of our cooling, that takes care of our, our, our drills. One thing about the drills is you want to make sure, if we extend the legs and extend the drills, that the drill head extends well below the landing struts. You need to make sure that these things can reach the ground. And you can actually test this, if I bring them back, by simply launching, deploy your drill, and then just simply start the harvester. And if you start seeing this coming up and you start seeing the numbers here happening, that means that everything is going great, it's working. Okay, we can actually retract and stop. If, however, the drills are too high, they will instead shut themselves down and display the message, no ground contact. You most certainly want to test this before going through all the effort of putting this down on another world. Now before we leave the lander in the VAB, I do want to take a look at one more thing with the drill that is important and that has to do with the rate at which it's able to extract ore. So if we go down to the bottom here, it says here that it will extract ore at 0.3 units of ore per second. However, when you actually use this in practice you will find that it actually is going to be a different number because there are a number of factors that build into this number one is where you're harvesting from uh, this is doing it from the surface of a body it is 0.3 per second and although it doesn't say it unfortunately on the asteroid or on a comet the base rate is one unit of ore per second. I think honestly they just flat out miss putting that information there. You also need to multiply this 0.3 by the ore percentage on the moon. You're never gonna land on something that's 100% ore, so you multiply by what percentage of what's in the ground is actually ore. Finally, if we look again at core heat, note that there is an optimal temperature of 500 degrees Kelvin for the drill. You want to maintain the drill at 500 degrees Kelvin. If it gets up to 1000 degrees Kelvin, the drill will shut down. But anything but 500, it's not going to be at 100% efficiency. If you provide the required amount of cooling, this will be 100% and you don't have to worry about it. So this thing's going to be fine, but if you don't have the required amount of cooling, Specifically, if you have too little cooling, you will find that that will affect the rate. And then finally, the last thing that affects the rate is whether you have a Kerbal aboard. That's why we put on the Mark I lander can. If you put in a non-engineer, the rate gets multiplied by 5%. If, however, you put in an engineer, the multiplier becomes 25% for a level zero engineer, five times as much. Up at the station, I have a level one engineer. He's the one that I'm going to be using, and for him, the multiplier is 45%. However, I do have here a level two engineer in Danilo. Danilo would change the multiplier to 65%, but I'm not gonna bother getting him up there. And the multiplier keeps going up with the level of the engineer. So you definitely wanna put an engineer on this thing. It makes a substantial difference. Let's go through the numbers and actually figure out what our ore haul rate is really going to be with this thing in a real situation. So remember our base rate here is 0.3 per second. 
you need to multiply that by the percentage of the ore. We discovered last episode that the average ore percentage on the moon is 5.89%. We're gonna do better than that, but let's take that number. So you take the 0.3, multiply it by 5.89%. You then multiply it by the thermal efficiency, which because we have the required amount of cooling is just 100%, so we don't really need to worry about that. And then finally, with our level one engineer, that's another 45%. So we multiply that on, that gets us a rate of 0.008 or per second. But of course I do have two drills, so multiplying by two gets 0.016 units of ore per second. Now this thing can hold 900 units of ore. So all I have to do is take the 900, divide it by my harvest rate to discover that at this rate, it would take well over 15 hours to collect this ore. As you'll see, we're going to do it much faster than that. So this underscores that it is important to find those higher ore concentrations. This lander is basically now complete. All I did was add in a few extra lights and then got this thing ready to be transferred to the moon. Now I've been doing a lot of transferring to the moon over the past few tutorials and if you caught any of them, you may remember that I budget 2,140 meters per second. This is to cover the last part of my orbital insertion around Kerbin, the transfer out to the moon and the rendezvous with the station. But if we take a look at the vacuum delta V for this vessel, it's at 2,811. And with the ability for me to refuel this thing, well, this thing can handle the transfer out there anyway, so there's no need for me to put on an additional transfer stage. I'm just going to go flat out to putting on the booster, and I save the booster to my booster library. It is booster number 13. We're just going to slap that on the bottom, and just going over it really, really quickly. There is a TD-25 decoupler, then the 2.5 meter fairing. After that, I have three of the X200-8 Rockamax fuel cans, and then the Rockamax Jumbo 64. Some AV-T1 winglets for additional stability, and underneath that, a mainsail liquid fuel engine. That is the whole booster. Uh, that gives me my required amount of delta V, and if we go to my sea level thrust to weight ratio of 1.33, and that was accomplished by just tweaking down the thrust on the mainsail to 68%. But with all of that, this thing is ready to fly. Once again, I'm not going to go over how to get to the station as it was all covered in the station building video. I am going to announce that this will be the last video in this series. Don't worry, I will keep making KSP tutorials, but with early access to KSP2 right around the corner from the date at which this video was published, I will be putting my energy into that for the next while. This doesn't mean I'm done with KSP1. If the demand is there, I will keep making videos for that too. I am going to take this opportunity to welcome aboard my most recent Patreon patrons and YouTube members, Robin Smiley, Nathan Walgren, and Dwayne Pegg. I am very grateful for their support, as well as the ongoing support of all of my members and patrons, and if you would also like to support this channel directly, the links are down there in the description. But with the lander now docked, I need to refuel it for its descent to the surface of the moon. So I've selected and pinned the context menu for one of the reserve tanks. But there are a lot of fuel cans on this lander, so it can be a little bit of a pain to just click on each of these individually. But what can help is if you go over here to the resource management tab, and if you Go over and click the little checkbox beside liquid fuel or oxidizer. I'm going to be filling both of them. What it does is it turns on the context menu for every single liquid fuel can on this station. But the ones I'm interested in, of course, are the ones on the lander. But what I can do is just kind of pull them all apart and with each of them, just hit the pin button so that I have all of them here selected. There we go, I've now selected every can on that lander. So now if I go back up to here and uncheck that liquid fuel, and I find sometimes, although it went down fine for me here, 
Sometimes I find I have to hover over them to get them to actually go away again. So now I've only pinned the context menus for the, for the fuel cans I'm interested in. I want to transfer out of this one into all of these. So now I just hit out for both liquid fuel and oxidizer. And now I'm filling up all the cans. It goes fairly slowly, especially if you have very small cans or a very big can feeding into very small cans, but that's fine. You just time warp and this will go faster. Once the resource transfer was complete, I transferred over our engineer bill, and then I used the resource scan that I did last episode to find a zone of high ore concentration, undocked, and performed my descent. I've landed on the moon a number of times in this series. If you need a hand with it, you can check out this video. But I do need to think about my solar panels here. If I came down and landed exactly in the orientation I'm in right now, and so let's put this thing on vertical, so I'll show you what I mean. Um, I'm still locked on retrograde, there we go. Notice how the solar panels wouldn't get very good exposure to the sun where the sun is positioned right now. So you're gonna want to make sure your vessel is oriented to give you good solar exposure when you're sitting there on the surface before you actually perform that landing. So something to be aware of before you touch down. Now is a good time for me to sort of set that all up. I do need that good solar exposure to run those drills. And there we are, a little bit slanty, but I think we are absolutely fine. Okay, let's start harvesting. So the first thing, extend these radiators out because we are gonna need to cool those drills. We will take each of the drill and we will deploy them. I'm not entirely sure if that sun is in the process of rising or setting. Uh, we'll find out very shortly. <laughs> I think it's rising, at least I hope it is. All right, and now we can just click on a drill and say start service harvesting and off it goes. We'll do the same thing for the other one. And let's pin this one and watch it. Notice how the core temperature is going up and then it stops at 500 degrees Kelvin, which is the ideal temperature. We have a thermal efficiency of 100%. That's because we have enough cooling. You can't, by the way, have too much cooling, but you certainly can have too little. But now that we are harvesting that ore, I can just time warp until my ore canisters are full. And that's when I realized the sun actually is setting here. So I had to shut everything down, time warp through the three day night, start the drills up again in the morning. And then it was just a few more hours until those ore containers were full. It was then time to shut everything down and start thinking about getting back up to the station. Notice how the radiators are glowing a nice red. I would keep them deployed while they are still like that until they've had a chance to cool down. Of course, the moon continued to rotate while we were on the surface, meaning we are no longer under the orbit of the station. As it would have taken at least a few hours to harvest the ore, this would have happened even if we didn't spend the night on the surface. Before taking off, I have to time warp until we are once again under the orbit of the station. While doing this, pay attention to which direction the station is moving as you want to launch in the same direction as the station. In this case, I have to go south. I ascended into a 10 kilometer parking orbit and then made my transfer back to the station. Once docked, I transferred all the ore I collected into the hauler, refilled the lander with liquid fuel, oxidizer, and monopropellant, and repeated this process again. After two more landings, my fuel hauler was full and ready to head back to Kerbin to complete the contract. Although I've done a number of videos where we had to insert ourselves into polar orbits and rendezvous with this station in a polar orbit about the moon, I have yet to have anything return to Kerbin from a polar orbit of the moon and there are some things to consider. So why don't we talk about that first? So here is our orbit. Remember how it works when you wanna return from the moon or from Mimis back to Kerbin is you need to eject yourself out from the moon going in a retrograde direction relative to the moon's direction around Kerbin. That will lower your periapsis with the Kerbin to the point where you're entering into the atmosphere. But from a polar orbit or for that matter from any highly inclined orbit, that can be a bit of a challenge. So for instance here, if I put a maneuver right here and push off, let's say, in this direction. 
let's say I'm heading off in that way, um, and I'm using about the right amount of delta V to return to Kerbin, uh, you can see that it's, it's ejecting off in an angle because of the orientation of my orbit, and it is not bringing my periapsis down towards Kerbin. Now, I can adjust the timing of this a little bit, but even though I am actually burning more than what it says I should to get myself into Kerbin's atmosphere, my periapsis isn't low enough. Now, one thing I could do is I could just increase the amount of the burn and force that periapsis down into the atmosphere, but that is not the best way to go. The whole problem here is that my ejection is at an angle from the direction that it should be. So how can I fix that? Here, let's delete the node. I fix that by waiting until the plane of this orbit is along the same direction as the moon's direction around Kerbin, and that just involves time warping. All I gotta do is time warp. Let's center this on the moon and you'll see this much more clearly. As I time warp, see how that angle changes as the moon goes around Kerbin. So all I gotta do is keep time warping. And I like to stop a little bit early because it's easy for me to move the maneuver forward a couple of orbits, but see how now, stop right here. Now, if I eject off in this direction, I will actually be going off in the direction that I want to go. Now, you got to pay attention which way around we're going. We're going around in this direction. In fact, this would be a good time for me to actually undock our vessel because <laughs> I'm not going to bring back the entire station, of course. Now, if I put a maneuver, oh, around here somewhere, remember what you want is for you to be going off in this direction, right? So if, if, you got to, if you put the maneuver in the wrong spot, you're not going, you know, I'm going off in the wrong direction. Again, it's going to be about 280 meters per second, because that's what it is to return. About there. Now adjust your maneuver position so that it is going off in the direction that you want, which is generally that way. And now you can see actually my periapsis is now into Kerbin itself. So that means I can dial this back a little bit. And what I'm going to shoot for is an altitude, I found with this rocket, about 30 kilometers worked well. Don't be afraid to play with the timing to try and get this as low as you can. Typically, your best spot is if you're, the plane of this orbit is equatorial, you're in about the right spot is usually the good indication. You also might find that it might be more efficient on the next orbit around, so don't be afraid to pop ahead in orbit and just keep playing with it until you're happy with what you got. It shouldn't be any more expensive than coming back from an equatorial orbit above the moon. That is looking pretty good. It's a 260 meter per second burn, and the reason why it's as efficient as it is is, well, look at the ejection. It is in a retrograde direction relative to the moon's orbit about Kerbin, and this burn's coming up in about an hour, so let's do it. And although it may not look like I'm burning in the right direction to get back to Kerbin, I most certainly am. That's just the magic of orbital mechanics. Once this burn is done, I would recommend that you do yourself a quick save. This is not exactly the most stable of landing things. Remember that all of this is going to be landing on the surface. It's rather tall. It could fall over. You might end up losing some of your ore if you land on the side of a steep hill or a cliff or something like that. So doing a quick save now means that if I end up landing in a very bad spot, I can revert back to here and I can just make a very slight adjustment to my periapsis which will end up getting me to land in a different location. Don't forget, quick saving is your friend. Okay, so we're about to disengage and get this thing to uh, enter into the atmosphere about 140 kilometers above the sea level. But there are a couple of things I want to do. I want to retract this antenna. So I'm just going to right click on it and retract the antenna. But I'm keeping these service bay doors open. The service bay doors have a surprising amount of drag and they will help keep this thing oriented in a retrograde direction as we go through the atmosphere. And then we're gonna stage, which is both going to get rid of that and arm our parachutes. And then we're going to put this on to the retrograde vector. And we're going to put this on surface. 
And we're going to hope here for the best. Now, I do have this set with plasma blackouts. This is something that you can adjust in the settings. And what a plasma blackout means is, is that radio signals can't go through the plasma that's generated as we go plowing through the atmosphere. And I'm going to lose my signal. And with the settings that I have, when I lose the signal, I will lose all control of this probe body. You will see this happen up here. Again, this is something you can adjust in the settings, but I wanted to put this on a worst case scenario to show you that even when I lose complete probe control of this, which will happen any moment now, this thing will still maintain its correct attitude. There we go. I now have no probe control, yet I'm going through the atmosphere still stuck on the retrograde vector. I don't have any lock to retrograde. I don't even have, I can't even turn the SAS off. I, can, I, I click on that, it does nothing. Uh, so right now I'm just have to depend on aerodynamics and ballistics to get this thing going where it needs to go. Because this thing is much more massive than a capsule, it's going to take a lot longer to slow down. So we're going to be traveling a significant portion around the planet before we get to a point where those parachutes might deploy. All right, we are now slowing down significantly. We should be losing our plasma, which means we got our radio signal is back and we have snapped back on to that retrograde vector. I now have SAS control once again. And now I'm waiting for those drogue shoots to deploy. There they go. And I'm going to turn off SAS because now the drogue shoots will do no, have no trouble whatsoever keeping this attitude the way I want. I can see that I'm going to be landing in the water. There go the rest of my shoots. Uh, this thing will sink. It's not a problem. It's very heavy. It will sink easily. In fact, if you are designing submarines, a container of ore is a great source of ballast <laughs> to get you to sink uh, where you want to go. So this thing will sink, but we'll be able to recover it once it is safely sitting on the bottom of the sea. We're coming closer to the surface, so I'm going to put on SAS again. Uh, looks like the ground is a little bit slanted. So I'll hopefully be able to use SAS to, uh, in case it wants to fall over, that I can keep it from falling over. Now one thing to be really careful about, good, it is sitting here, do not recover right away. Notice that there is a requirement in the contract to maintain stability for 10 seconds. So we have to wait for that to go green. If you recover right away, then you don't get it. So here it is, my contract now has gone green. Now I can recover the vessel. But just because the contract is done, that doesn't mean I am. There is still some leftover ore at the station, so I thought I would finish this off by taking a look at how to use a Convertitron to convert that ore into useful resources. And this is my Convertitron module, ready to be attached to my ever-growing moon station. But before we see this thing in action, let's take a closer look at the module. Here is the module that holds on the Convertitron. So let's spend a little bit of time just going over this. This is very simple, by the way. It's just a docking port, adapter, the Convertitron itself, another adapter, a couple of batteries, then some struts to just kind of create a little bit of a tower two of the Gigantor XL solar arrays, and then four of the thermal control smalls. And let's just go over the different Convertitrons. There's two different Convertitrons. Let's go over their stats and let me show you how I decided to do what it is that I did. So if I take a look, there is the Convertitron 250 and the Convertitron 125. 250 is the bigger one. The 125 is the smaller one. This one here is the bigger one. It has a mass of four and a quarter tons. Just to put it on here, let's just show you what the smaller one looks like. I can stick it on the end actually. There is the smaller one there, so you can see it is significantly smaller and only has a mass of one and a quarter tons. So what's the difference between the two? Well, let's go over their statistics, starting with the one I got, the Convertitron 250. What it does is it takes ore and electric charge and turns that into resources. So for instance, you could turn it into liquid fuel and oxidizer, and it does generate these two at a rate at w that is proportional to the rate at which they get used up. So you won't end up with a situation where you have way too much liquid fuel or way too much oxidizer. 
You can also use it to convert to make monopropellant. You can create liquid fuel alone, or you can just create oxidizer alone. Let's stick with the liquid fuel and oxidizer part, because that's the part I'm going to be taking a look at. So it takes half a unit of ore per second and 30 units of electric charge per second to make 0.45 units of liquid fuel per second and 0.55 units of oxidizer per second. These are again the base rates. These will go down if you don't have enough cooling, like just like with the drills, if you have too little cooling, this thing will overheat and it will shut down. But even if it doesn't shut down, it will operate at less than this rate. In addition, an engineer will affect the rate based on its level in exactly the same way as it does for drills. And by the way, more engineers don't make this better. Don't fill your whole station with of engineers. It just looks at the engineer with the highest level to make the calculations. Any more doesn't make any particular difference. So that is the Convertitron 250. How does that compare to the Convertitron 125? So if I go to the same section where it makes liquid fuel and oxidizer, instead of, let's go back and forth between these two, half a unit of ore per second being consumed, this one consumes 2.5 units of ore per second. So five times as much ore gets used up by the Convertitron 125. Still the same amount of electric charge though. 30 units of electric charge here, 30 units of electric charge here. So you are gonna need some good solar generation with these. So you might be going, oh, this one uses up five times the amount of ore. It must produce a lot more liquid fuel and oxidizer. Nope. If we just look at the liquid fuel part, it produces 0.22 units of liquid fuel per second, while the Convertitron 250 creates 0.4 units of liquid fuel per second. So it produces, by using up five times as much ore, it produces about half the amount of resources. So it is far less efficient. That's the big difference between them. Um, this one produces your resources at far less efficiency than this one does. So why would you use the smaller one? Well, the main reason is, is because it is three tons lighter than the bigger one. So that is why you would use this one. If you have a situation where you want a lighter Convertitron, and a perfect example of this would be if you had a vehicle that was gonna land on a surface, extract the ore from that surface, convert it into resources, and then use those resources to take off again. So a vehicle that can refuel itself, you don't wanna put on an extra three tons of mass. Three tons of extra payload mass can turn into a lot more propellant mass, turns into bigger engines, and it can run away on you very quickly. So even though this is less efficient, for a refueling lander, you may want to go with the Convertitron 125 rather than the Convertitron 250. Either way, I went with the 250. You can see that I put on the Gigantor XL solar arrays. If I go to here and take a look at them, they each produce 24.4 units of electric charge per second. So together, that is 48.8 units of electric charge per second, clearly well over the 30 that is required. Also, at 30 units of electric charge being consumed per second, if you again did that while you're in the day or in the night side of the moon, or if you were doing that while you were, say for instance, in a curb and eclipse, you're gonna use up a lot of electricity Covering that with batteries becomes very, very arduous. So my advice is put a token amount of batteries on like I did here, and then just simply don't run this thing at night. If we take a look at the cooling, they do have a different requirement when it comes to cooling. The Convertitron 250 has, if I find the required cooling, 200 kilowatts of required cooling, while the 125 is only 100 kilowatts of, so half the cooling is required. I ended up using, same thing I put on that drilling lander, I used the thermal control smalls. There are 50 kilowatts of cooling each, and I just simply put on four of them. I found that easier than simply putting on uh, bigger radiators. But with that, let's get out to the station and see this in action. Actually, one more thing about the radiators. 
they are attached perpendicular to the solar panels because radiators actually want to do the opposite of what the solar panels want to do. Solar panels want to get the maximum solar exposure. Radiators want to get the minimum solar exposure. So they want to be able to turn themselves edge on to the sun because the sun is going to heat up the radiator and that's going to make them less effective. So when you put on deployable radiators on a station like this, make sure your radiators are perpendicular to your solar panels. Anyway, to convert this ore to something useful, all I have to do is right click on the Convertitron. We'll pin this over to here. And you can see down here we have this start ISRU. Uh, we can do liquid fuel and oxidizer, monopropellant, liquid fuel, or oxidizer. Considering that all the vehicles docked on here all use liquid fuel and oxidizer, and I am completely filled up with monopropellant or very, very close to it, I'm going to make liquid fuel and oxidizer. And all I have to do is push the start that button and off it goes. You can see the core temperature increasing just like with the drills, but it should cap out at a thousand and then stop so that we have 100% thermal efficiency because of our level one engineer board. We are getting a 45% production bonus, just like we did when we were drilling. And you can see what's happening here is that the ore is being very slowly consumed at a rate of 0.23 units per second. And we are generating liquid fuel and oxidizer. And if you want to speed this up, all you need to do is time warp. So you can see that with this, we actually never have to bring up fuel to this station again. It is completely self-sufficient, just pulling up ore from the surface. And while this process finishes off, why don't I take this opportunity to go over the main takeaways from this episode? A good chunk of this tutorial was devoted to building a moon harvester, taking a close look at the game's drilling excavators. Make sure to check the required cooling to ensure that you have enough radiators. I also took some time to look at how the ore harvesting rate is calculated, drawing particular attention to the value of finding high ore concentrations and having an engineer along. Transferring resources in the game, especially when multiple small tanks are involved, can be a bit tedious. The resource tab can be used to open up and pin multiple menus at the same time. I also looked at how to efficiently return to Kerbin from a polar orbit. Just time warp until the orbits align for your next ejection window. And finally, I looked at how to use the game's convertitrons to process your harvested ore into useful resources. And with that, I'm going to be drawing this episode and this series to a close. I hope that you found these tutorials useful in your own games and that I'll be seeing you again for KSP2. 